Welcome back. Now we go to our feature for the evening. The former UK Prime Minister, Tony Blair, has apologised for mistakes made over the Iraq war. He admitted that the war had caused the rise of the Islamic State group and said there were mistakes in the planning after the removal of former Iraqi President Saddam Hussein. Khalil Charles has this report. The ex-Prime Minister confessed his decision to invade Iraq bore some responsibility for the emergence of the Islamic State in Iraq today. Despite not having United Nations agreement, Blair went ahead and supported the American government's decision to invade Iraq and depose Saddam Hussein's regime. The Bush administration based its rationale for war principally on the assertion that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction and that Saddam Hussein's government posed an immediate threat to the United States and its coalition allies. But after the invasion, no substantial evidence was found to support the claims that weapons of mass destruction ever existed. Now, Tony Blair, who was Prime Minister between 1997 and 2007, has apologised that the intelligence he had received was wrong. An estimated 150,000 people lost their lives as a direct result of the war, and estimates say up to 600,000 people have been killed since. Following the war, Iraq held multi-party elections in 2005. Nouri al-Maliki became Prime Minister in 2006 and remained in office until 2014. Many have blamed the Maliki government for marginalizing the Sunni community and claimed that this led to the rise of the Islamic State group. Blair said mistakes in planning had been made, particularly in the understanding of what would happen once the regime was removed. Former Prime Minister made it clear that he defended the decision to back the U.S. invasion of Iraq and said he found it hard to apologize for removing Saddam. For some, his apology has come far too late. Most of the editorials and commentaries in the U.K. newspapers view Tony Blair's interview as a spin operation ahead of the Chilcot report, which is expected to be heavily critical of the former Prime Minister. The Daily Mail accused him of weasel words in an apology of sorts. The Daily Mirror thought he had delivered a half-hearted apology that will be no comfort to families whose loved ones never came home. And the Daily Telegraph rejected any sense that it amounted to an apology. They said that Blair was making sure the political ground had been prepared for the fight to defend his reputation. In August, Jeremy Corbyn, before being elected the Labour leader, suggested that Tony Blair could be made to stand trial for war crimes over the invasion of Iraq in what he called an illegal war. Khalil Charles, The Report. Well, joining me to discuss this is Middle East political commentator Sabah al Mukhtar and Bilal Zainab Ahmed, who's a social activist and doctoral student at the School of Oriental and African Studies here in London. Uh, welcome to the programme, both of you. Um, uh, Sabah, before we get on to the Chilcot inquiry context of this, there's, there's perhaps one other thing that we didn't mention in the report, and that's the leaked uh, emails from Colin Powell to President Bush a year before the invasion, saying that Tony Blair is fully on board with this. Do you think in some way what Blair had to say was a response to those leaks? Well, it could be, and I think Chilcot will be, will be forced to look at this whether he wants to or not, whether he can or not, but he must look at it, because otherwise this report is going to be incomplete, because here we have the Prime Minister of uh, Britain giving an undertaking to the Americans to go along with them a year earlier, and for a whole year he was misleading the public, he was misleading Parliament, and he was uh, 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 making statements which are not correct, that they are seeking political solutions when he has already given his undertaking to go to war. So, of course, it, this could be a, a, an important thing. But I think the British uh, newspapers today have addressed the issue. It's a project of an apology. It's not even a, an apology. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. But I think, certainly, it is, it is anticipating what the Chitkos report is going to come, whereby it's going to be transformed 
from a public inquiry into what is hoped to do. A lot of the lawyers are expecting that should become a, 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 an inquiry, a judicial inquiry, whereby Tony Blair on the uh, prima facie evidence will be asked questions. Mm. Uh, Bilal, is that, is that it, or most of it? Is that it's about preparation for the Chilcot inquiry, do you think? I think that's exactly what's going on. Uh, we have to remember that uh, Tony Blair has proven time and time again that he's willing to use manipulative language in order to further his own objectives, and that's clear the case here. Uh, the Chilcot inquiry, of course, has itself been deeply politicized, and it's extremely controversial for taking so long in order to publish its findings. And we also need to bear in mind that it's, this is being done finally after the election. Mm. Do, do you expect that there will be any serious uh, consequences from, from Chilcot? I mean, as you say, it's taken a long time. Indeed, it's taken so long that one member of the inquiry panel has died while it's been sitting. Um, so do you expect anything serious to come of it? Well, I'm, uh, well, I don't want to speak too soon, um, given that it hasn't really been released yet. However, I can see from uh, Tony Blair's response that he's attempting to give room for himself in order to ignore the fact that uh, Downing Street deliberately stripped out caveats from the intelligence that it was given, and it deliberately overstated the evidence that it had. And um, I wonder if part of what's happening is that uh, Mr. Blair is partially aware of the fact that the Chilcot inquiry is not definitive in its attacks on his administration for doing that. Mm. Uh, Sapa, I mean, th that was one of the sort of um, more incredible moments of the apology where he blamed the security services um, for the intelligence that he received, whereas everybody knows that he was actually um, involved in the construction and editing uh, and presentation of that intelligence. It was hardly, you know, Prime Minister sits at desk, head of MI6 comes in, gives him report, he reads report, he reports report, was it? Uh, this is not new, actually. He said this in Parliament to a certain degree. He tried to blame others by saying the intelligence was not there. And the apology is for the intelligence, not for his mistake, uh, which is contrary to the facts on the ground, because Britain has the experience of occupying countries and running them. Iraq was, in, in the 20s of last century, it was part of the British mandate. It installed the government there, which had exactly the same thing as was done in 2003, whereby a king was brought from Saudi Arabia. Uh, a treaty was signed, a defense treaty between King George VI and King Faisal. The oil deals were struck off. Parla and, uh, a, a new constitution was imported. However, Britain created a survivable state which is friendly to the United Kingdom. When we come to 2003, these processes went through, but at the end of the day, Nobody is taking the blame for the loss of life, not only of the Iraqis. The British public, the, the soldiers in this country, defend. They, they go into the army to defend queen and country. And none of them went to Iraq and gave his life in defense of queen and country. They were all the victims of an agreement between Tony Blair and George Bush. And there is quite a lot of that thing. And the, the Chilcot inquiry, the bits we heard in public, gives a prima facie case and many lawyers are waiting for the report to come out so that an application will be made to the Crown Prosecution Service to commence a, a judicial inquiry because this is what we need because unless that leaders who make mistakes and, and cause the death of so many people in so many countries pay the price or being asked the questions, I think we'll continue to have this repeat performance which is contrary to humanity, contrary to international law, the United Nations Charter, constitutions of countries, and every other conceivable moral and ethical ground. Mm. Uh, Bilal, uh, one of the more interesting things that, that Blair had to say was that uh, uh, he had to agree that um, the outcome of the war and invasion was at least partly responsible for the rise of the Islamic State. Now, that's something which the political elite are less interested in hearing, given that they have a very restricted um, kind of frame within which they try to deal with these things that they're at the moment trying to build up support for uh, renewed bombing in Syria. Um, so how do you think that admission is likely to play out? Well, I think that um, part of what's going on is that you have quite a lot of scholarship and quite a lot of journalism being produced that can't really be avoided when it comes to political rhetoric. A lot of people have been talking about the fact 
that Islamic State is rising with such rapidness as a direct result of the war in Iraq, and it's increasingly difficult to deny that even within the confines of a normal political discourse. So I think what we're seeing here is that uh, Mr. Blair is attempting to get ahead of the criticism that um, ISIS is a direct result of the war in Iraq, which it is, by attempting to redefine the outer parameters of the discussion to argue that uh, the Iraq war and the invasion and the occupation of Iraq by the U.S. and the U.K. and occupational forces um, was one factor that led to the creation of Islamic State, and he's attempting to put that in a context with the uh, activities of Assad and his forces in Syria. Of course, the problem with that is that it fundamentally ignores the fact that during the Iraq war itself, uh, Bashar al-Assad and the Syrian regime had their geopolitical behavior changed by just the fact that their, everyone's strategic calculus had to take into account the fact that Saddam Hussein was violently removed from power and that there was a massive power vacuum in Iraq. So really, you're not seeing um, anything uh, of an admission or anything of an um, uh, attempt to grapple with the reality of what happened. What you're seeing is Blair recognizing that he can't conceivably deny it outright and instead seeking to deny it while accepting some parameters of the argument. Mm. Uh, Saba, what do you make of that part of the discussion that Blair was having there? Um, why do you think he said that? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, Blair knows very well that if you remove the central regime, central government, central power, the uh, military forces, the uh, law enforcement agencies, you dismantle a state, you know that you are creating a vacuum that is going to be filled by the uh, parties that you don't want them, including terrorists. Uh, this is a fact. He cannot deny it. Whether he admits it or not, a consequence of his action leading Britain when there were two million people on the street saying we cannot go, that's in, in London and there are in other parts of the world, he still went to war because he has given his word to Bush a year earlier. That, that fact cannot be, dis, cannot be ignored. So he's trying now to divert the attention. He's using this spin. He's trying to talk about other uh, issues, trying to raise other, like the, the, the Arab Spring, like all the other things. But we all know that in international affairs, there isn't always one single cause. But if you have a cause which contributes 95% of the result, and you have 10 other causes which contributes only 5%, then certainly the main cause is the one you talk about, and that is the invasion. And don't forget, although we are talking about this one in this way, but in fact, everything that has been done was contrary to international law, contrary to all norms, in, mm. in whether one, one is talking about the UN uh, uh, Charter or whether one is talking about international law. What was done was a criminal effect par excellence resulted in the disaster we are facing now with a huge loss of life and destabilization of the region and creating this havoc we have and the, the scourge of terrorism both in that region and indeed in this part of the world. Mm. Uh, Bilal, uh, it seems that Tony Blair has very few defenders left. I mean, we ran some of the press commentary at the beginning of the programme. Not much sympathy for him there. Um, Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of his own party, is now saying that perhaps he'll face charges over war crimes. I mean, insofar as any argument can be said to be conclusively won in politics, um, the argument against Blair's case for war has been won, hasn't it? Yes, I would, I would agree with that. And that's why we need to be a bit careful about the rhetoric that he's choosing, because much of the argument has been won. However, it hasn't been won in a way that's advantageous for a future anti-war activism. And it had, certainly hasn't been won in a way that can ensure that something like the war in Iraq doesn't happen again. And the key uh, thing here is that he repeatedly said that the, the war was a mistake and that the intelligence was wrong. However, we need to emphasize the fact that it, the due dubiousness of the intelligence that they received was actually quite well known and that it was an extremely tense topic, not just in anti-war activism, like the rallies that were brought up 
but also as a result of institutional changes that were going on, uh, the fact that there was a lot of opposition within Westminster and within Downing Street and within intelligence agencies and within the military against this type of behavior. Um, Blair is perfectly aware that all of that was happening. However, this uh, statement that it was simply a mistake uh, implies that everyone just sort of was unable to understand that the intelligence was just improper, rather than the caseful war being deliberately manufactured in a certain direction and critics meticulously silenced. And then when the invasion actually began, actual plans for occupying and administering the country that made sense were completely ignored. Hmm. Um, Saba, uh, one of the other things, one of the more interesting things that Blair had to say was about the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. Now, obviously, the war wasn't supposed to be about that, because if it had been about regime change, that would have been straight out illegal. Um, but he did raise the question of the Arab revolutions, and he did seem to indicate that he had some sort of inkling that, um, that Saddam might have fallen during the Arab revolutions, and that had he done so, that at least would have been at the hands of the Iraqi people, and therefore not have resulted in this kind of chaos um, that we've seen now. What do you make of that? Well, I think I, I don't think this is how he wanted to portray the issue. He wanted to portray it that the Arab Revolution, the Arab uh, uprising, by itself has created this vacuum, the, this upheaval. Uh, therefore, this contributed to the creation of the Islamic fundamentalism or the Islamic State or Daesh or call it what you want. This is what he's. I think this is the indication of what he's trying to say. He's trying to underplay the 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 consequences of invading Iraq, destroying the state, dismantling it, dismantling all the uh, 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 armies and the police. And, you know, can you believe it? Even the traffic police were fired. There were nothing left in that country. And yet he is saying that because of the Arab uh, uh, uprising, see what happened in the other countries. So it is really not us, but it is the Arab, maybe it is a little bit uh, our fault, but it's the Arab uprising uh, which has created this pressure to create this Islamic State, Islamic uh, uh, terrorism that is being uh, 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 displayed by ISIS uh, and Daesh and the rest of, of the... So I think he was trying to divert the attention from the effect of the invasion on the creation of the IS by making reference to the uprising. I think this is what he was trying to say that it's really not only the invasion, but as you know, the Arab uprising by itself would have created this. I think this mm. is what he was trying to, to say. OK, Sabah al-Mukhtar and um, Bilal Ahmed, thanks very much for joining us. But I'm <laughs>